To my knowledge, uh, Hamilton is hosting its first ever Naval Retail Seminar. We're so happy today to have them here with us. Casey Kidd heads up the organization and he's a native to Mississippi and uh, comes to us by way of Dallas, Texas, where his corporate offices are and, and Memphis and other places. But uh, we're so happy to have them on board with the city. Uh, uh, about a year ago, the city actually joined this organization, maybe a little less than a year. But we place great confidence in that <coughs> retail and having a good track record and having the ability to bring businesses to towns that didn't previously have brand name biz uh, businesses. They've been out diligently searching for businesses that fit with Hamilton, but today the thrust of this meeting is to aid and assist existing businesses and landowners to put their uh, uh, lands and properties maybe uh, more aware to the public uh, that, it, that it could be marketable and uh, uh, developable. And then, uh, of course, Casey and his organization want to work with the businesses that are already established here in Hamilton and make sure that they have the marketing strategies within their shops that would make them more prosperous in their effort as they go forward with their own businesses. So, Casey, yes, we're most delighted today to have y'all with us and uh, we'll have, a, it looks like an intimate group today. We have refreshments in the room, so if you uh, feel like you need some refreshments, come on to the table and get you something. And we're happy to have our uh, video folks here today to uh, capture this seminar on video so that we can give it back to those that couldn't be in attendance uh, with us today. Um, this is a trial and error type uh, seminar. We've never done it before, but we might build on it. It might be better uh, next time we try it. So, Casey, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take us forward uh, today and uh, give us uh, the knowledge you have up there in that good head of yours. <laughs> Not you to put much. me on the spot. <laughs> oh, we're happy um, to have you. So I, uh, back in 2012, started working for another company very similar to what we do now and um, did that for about four years and we started this six years ago. But the idea of having a workshop was one of the first things that we started incorporating with every project. The reason being is that what we found is that having community buy-in on all levels helps further development. And so that's not just property owners and that's not just the city, that's local businesses, everyone involved coming together for the same purpose and that is growing Hamilton. And so that was something that we implemented a long time ago and we've been doing it since. Um, and so what we ultimately look for is just engagement in the community and having that throughout the process of us recruiting retailers. Uh, because at the end of the day, if I go to a trade show out in California and I come back with a prospect, they're still going to have to talk to a local property owner. They're still going to have to talk to the city. And so I don't want it to be the first time that I'm meeting some of these people when I have an interested, you know, party. I want it to be long before, you know, I have someone interested that I've met these people and got to know everyone that way. When I call them up and say, hey, you know, I've got someone interested. And I, well, who is this? You know, I've never talked to you before. And so that's kind of where this idea came from. The goal for this presentation is really to serve, and my clicker may not, there it goes, may have gotten too far, is to serve as an overview of the market first and foremost and show kind of what's currently in Hamilton, uh, what the market looks like as far as retail is concerned, and a lot of this data, as we found, could be used even if you owned a local business. And so we, we feel that a success breeds success, so as we're successful, local businesses should also be successful and vice versa. So what we want to do here is just kind of go over a lot of the, the background of our data, where it comes from, how we get it, what it all means, um, you know, things that are like leakages and sales figures, uh, market size, retail trade areas, and so we'll be going, going over all of that today. One of the first things that we always ask when we enter a market uh, is, do you know where your customers are coming from? Um, and, you know, we always get responses, well, they're coming, you know, we get people from here, 
but it's usually based on well, I saw a license plate in the parking lot, or I, uh, you know, I heard I was talking to someone at the cash register, and they said that they had driven in from so and so. Um, so the good part for what we do is we have a way of showing where they're coming from on a verifiable level using cell phones. Woo. Presentation. I know. We're done. I don't know what happened there. So we go through and we look at every cell phone that's in the market, where it's coming from, where it's going to, how long it was there, how many times it was there. Um, and then we pair that with other data sets like credit card transactions, consumer spending surveys, psychographics, demographics, the whole nine yards. And so basically what that shows us is not only what, where people are, where they're coming from, but also how they're spending money, which is really important if you own a local business. And so this is some of that raw data right here. And so this is actually Hamilton data. It kind of looks like Easter eggs. Uh, but this is before we filter it down. This is literally how it comes to us. And we're able to see, all right, well, the businesses that we surveyed here, here's where everyone originated from. So this is where everyone lives and the businesses that we surveyed, where they drove in from or where they started. And so when we filter this down, we come up with what we, what we call a retail trade area. And so for Hamilton, we found that kind of a unique market has a wider draw where we couldn't just sum this area up in one trade area. We would have to do at least two, especially when you start involving businesses like Love's. Obviously, there's a lot of people that spend dollars at Love's, but um, they're not going to be a frequent shopper. They're going to be getting gas off the side of the road you know, and getting back on the road, head towards Memphis or Birmingham. Um, but we need to count those as well because those are potential consumers. They may not be buying their groceries here, but they might stop and get a burger, they might get some chicken on the way to, to Birmingham, and so that's something that we want to make sure we capture as well. So this is our primary retail trade area, and I know it's a little, <laughs> a little hard to see, but this is where we estimate the buyer propensity is between 85 and 90 percent, 90 to 95 percent actually. And so what this means is that the buyer propensity is how likely someone is to make a purchase. And so people originating from that area that I just showed you. Yeah, can you go back to that? Yeah, was, my thing will cooperate. Touch the state line. Can you see the state line? The state line is right here. Okay. And so it's, I know it's very faint, but it's right there. And so, you know, when you start getting closer to Amory, Aberdeen, and even Fulton, people are not coming over here to buy groceries. But people from these areas buy groceries. So we consider this to be the highest buyer propensity that originates from this area here. It's just below the suburbs. No one. You gotta reach up over there and get some more Because it's shed that we have Winfield people. And again, you've got to consider they made a purchase here, yes, we can prove that. But why? At the end of the day, that's the part that's the hardest to show. And so then I rely back on the city and people that I meet to say, well, you know, this is why. And so what we found is that some things that consumers do don't necessarily make sense. Uh, and it's that they don't make sense in theory, but they make sense to that consumer. And it could be that they're here for work. And so then they're, they're working a job here and they need to pick up groceries on the way home or they need to you know, grab a bite to eat while they're at lunch or something like that. And so I knew uh, growing up in Pontotoc, there's a little town there called Ecru, and it's home to Ashley Furniture. They employ 4,000 people, uh, which is crazy because the town itself is only about 900 people. But they employ 4,000 people, and I know because I've got family members that work there, they have employees that drive 45 minutes to get to this plan. And so in theory, no one should ever buy or drive 45 minutes to stop at Dollar General. But what happens is they drove there for work and then on their way home, oh, I need to pick up, you know, a loaf of bread or something like that. We have a Dollar General market in that group. And they want to pick up a loaf of bread as they're headed home or some milk or whatever they need on their way home. And so it's not normal for a consumer to be driving that far to pick up a loaf of bread. But they were there all ready for work and so then when they drove home, they said, all right, well, you know, I just stopped by the store. And so those dollars were captured by that community. But we wouldn't really consider them part of their primary retail trade area just because that's a little bit of a, an anomaly. So then we have the secondary retail trade area. 
and this is what that looks like. As you can imagine, this is a much larger area. And so what this means is the buyer propensity is still there, but not as high. So these people would make a purchase, but they're not as likely to make a purchase or as a frequent purchase uh, in the market. So people in this area may or may not buy their groceries here. But they did spend dollars here, and that's one thing that we can verify. So people originating from these areas, for one reason or another, were here and spent money. They're just not as likely as the people that I just showed you in the primary retail area. <coughs> we estimate the buyer propensity here is 15 to 30 percent, meaning that you're 30 percent likely to get a purchase if you owned a, a store uh, or a restaurant or something like that in Hamilton. You might get about 15 to 30 percent of their business essentially. So then we look at the city's population which after the 2020 census is just over 7,000. But we don't want to advertise that because then we know people are coming from outside the city limits to buy stuff here and shop here. And so then we want to look at the total retail trade area and what that number is because those represent the consumers that are here spending money. So when you put those two together, you can see the primary in green and the uh, secondary in blue. This represents 44,309 frequent shoppers. And so these are people that on a frequent basis spend dollars in Hamilton, which is a lot more than 7,000 people. So then when we're out there trying to attract the next retailer or if you're a local business owner, that's the number you need to be shooting for because we have verified there is this many people shopping frequently in the city limits of Hamilton. So then we perform a gap analysis, and what this is, is what I was talking about earlier, it's all supply and demand. And so then we're looking at the fact that, all right, how much money do these 44,000 people spend? And effectively, we've tallied up that they spent $521 million. And so then we want to look at, all right, well, how much did Hamilton supply them? So the businesses that are currently in Hamilton, out of that $500 million, how much did Hamilton actually provide them with? And nearly $200 million, which is a, a, a good chunk of change. But we found that this leaves over $300 million of merchandise <coughs> goods services that they went somewhere else to go buy. And growing up in the area, I know good and well how many people go over to Tupelo on a regular basis and spend that $333 million. This is basically the tax revenue that the city gets from the dollar spent in Tupelo. I can attest to that. And so then you're looking, at, it seems like a big figure, but when you think about your own shopping patterns and divide that number by 44,000 people, it's not a ton of money. You know, it's, it's, it's not as much as it looks like. And it's very realistic to think that over time, in a year's span, that 44,000 people would take $300 million over to Tupelo, to the mall, the area around the mall, Longhorn, any of the restaurants over there, go see a movie. And so this is where the opportunity exists to capture this $300 million in some form or fashion. And so then just restaurant leakage alone is $40 million. That means that people that were from this trade area went to Tupelo and other places and spent on the upwards of $40 million just eating out, just going to a restaurant that was not in their area. Virtually all of them dined at the sit-down family-style restaurant the past six months. So that means that out of 44,000, virtually all of the 44,000 have eaten at a family-style sit-down restaurant the past six months. And so then you know, all right, well if we only have so many here, seven days in a week, I know I eat out a lot, and not everybody eats out seven days a week, but if you, even if you ate out three days a week, we need more sit-down family-style restaurants because then, you know, after three or four restaurants, where do you go next? And that's ultimately <coughs> what happens with these consumers is they leave the market and go to other places that have different restaurants and other family style uh, sit down restaurants. And that's one of the areas that we're looking to hopefully cover with our services and going to these trade shows that we go to is to capture some more of these retailers and these restaurants that provide these goods and services. Grocery leakage, leakage was nearly $38 million. And so that means that someone somewhere in that area is going somewhere else besides Hamilton and spending on the upwards of $38 million on groceries. One thing that's you know, important to note with groceries is that 
people don't necessarily buy more groceries. They buy what they need at one place and they go to another place. We worked in Oxford, Mississippi, big college town, and there's a, uh, we did work for Kroger there. And so we did a, a study on the Kroger there and we juxtaposed that with a study from Walmart. And what we found in our, our cell phone data was that people were going to Walmart first and buying all their dry goods and then driving all the way across town, which given, you know, if traffic's heavy, it's going to be 15 minutes to drive across town. But they were going all the way 15 minutes later to Kroger and getting their wet goods. And so then they go to Walmart and get all their, you know, their pasta and bread and, you know, soups and stuff like that. And then they would drive over to Kroger and get all their meats and deli items. Which is really interesting just because they were never really competing. They were just, they got one product at one place and they got the other product at the other place. And so that was just the traffic pattern between those, those two businesses. Which is really interesting just because even if you have a grocery store here, there might be a chance that someone's leaving that grocery store, obviously they are, and going to another grocery store to get something that they think that grocery store has better. Well, I, I can attest to that. I, I own a pharmacy and over the counter stuff. You know, I, I can, you know, I can give that away sometimes. Right. People pick that up at Walmart or the dollar store. Right. When they're in their shopping, <coughs> you know, they're not necessarily shopping at my store. Right. So. And that's where again, this all represents opportunity that we can potentially capitalize on. So then we go a step further and we look at what we call psychographics, which is a representation of consumer behavior. Not necessarily just demographics and not necessarily um, just sales data, but lifestyle trends, what people like to do or what they enjoy doing. We get a lot of this information through credit card transactions and through Experian, which is a credit reporting agency. They have a lot of these data sets and line level um, data sets that we can use to really see at the line level what are people doing. So we break this down in 67 total segments, and I'll give you some of the, the highlights from those. Consumers here are more concerned with cost than with quality. And that means they're always looking for a good deal, very budget conscious, um, maybe running a, an ad in the newspaper or a coupon in the newspaper would be good, or having uh, some type of like online uh, special. As we've seen things like that be very successful with local businesses just because they've already said, hey, we want cost to be the first priority, then quality. And it's not that they like low quality goods, but it doesn't matter how high the quality is if they've got to pay twice as much for that, you know, and the consumers here are just not willing to do that. They're willing to shop around to find the best price. They'll get online. Uh, this is where you can do things like price matching and being able to do like, you know, well, Amazon's got it for this or, or whatever. Walmart.com has it for this. It's sometimes better to at least, you know, give up a little bit of your margin to get that sale because at the end of the day they're going to remember where they bought that and if they really liked it they'll be back for more uh, but sometimes that that barrier to get them to become a customer is just the price and if you can do something like price matching sometimes that will convert someone that's used to shopping online to shopping more locally uh, because it is more convenient uh, one of the companies we've done a lot of work for in the past is AutoZone uh, mainly because they're based in Memphis and I've, I've gotten to know a lot of those guys but um, one thing that I've asked them before is did the advent of the internet and online hurt you in any way and largely their answer is no and then they're kind of a different type of uh, retailer anyway but the reason being is that they've got their store so close to their consumers that it would be you would be hard-pressed to go online and get anything quicker than you can get it at an auto zone just because even towns of 900 people now have an auto zone five minutes from everybody that lives in that town's house and then so then you know when it's a sunny day on a on a saturday and it's time you want to change your brake pads you're not thinking about getting on amazon and ordering these brake pads you're driving down to auto zone because you pass it a million times over the past year and buy those brake pads and so there's some businesses that have been virtually unaffected by online just because their model gets them more, it makes them more convenient, gets them closer to their consumers than Amazon could ever be. And we might see that change over time. I don't know. I can't speak for Amazon. They've got a lot more money than I do. But I will say that AutoZone, it's not mattered to them because they have got their stores, and I promise you, 
You may not know it's there until you need it, but at the same time, there's an auto zone close by no matter where you live. That's just that's the way that they do business. They're also very family oriented here. And so that's where, you know, having a sort of one-stop shop for the entire family. This can be stores, this can be restaurants, but really having something that caters to the entire family is very important for the shoppers here and must be considered, you know, if you own a local business. This is something, speaking of AutoZone, they would care a lot about. So consumers here are more inclined for DIY projects, meaning they are more inclined to go and, you know, change their brake pads on a Sunday. Uh, or a Saturday and, and what you'll notice is that you don't see a lot of these types of stores in high income areas just because a lot of people that you know are high income don't change their own oil. And so then AutoZone's not going to build a store in a market that's got household incomes of $220,000 a year because most of those people don't change their own oil. But in middle class America where everyone, you know, there's, there's communities like this where people do like to work on their cars, they like to do, you know, uh, home improvement projects. You'll see more of these building materials and auto parts stores because they are more inclined for these types of tasks. I think this hits home with the mayor here. A lot of outdoor uh, activities such as hunting and fishing. And that's not necessarily saying that you must sell rifles in your boutique but at the same time you have to consider that you know there's uh, you know a chance that each member of the family is participating in these types of activities um, I had a, a friend call me the other day he lives in Tupelo and, and they're considering opening up a boutique and it's going to be geared towards I think uh, infant to like toddler clothing and so just a very young children's clothing store but um, as much as I know he likes to hunt, I can guarantee you they will have some camouflage onesies in there if he has anything to do about it. And so that's where, you know, it's a joke. But at the same time, I think that there's ways in which to cover a lot of these things that people like to do here, no matter what you're doing and what you're selling. Convenience is very important. Um, we, Laney and I were in, uh, in Jackson, Tennessee, uh, recently, and one of the conversations that we were having with the mayor there was the fact that um, people don't want to park and then have to walk anywhere. They want to be able to park right in front of here, in, in front of your business. And you know, it's there's. I went yesterday uh, when I was in Tupelo and, and walked around the mall just to see what all had changed there. And I got in probably 8,000 steps by the end of the day, but. Some people, I'm telling you, like if they can't park in that spot that's right in front of your door, it's game over for them. And so that's where, you know, parking is, is one component of this, but convenience is very important to the consumers here. And I'm not saying that parking is the only issue with that, but um, you know, one of the things to consider is that that can be a barrier for them becoming a customer. If they can't get to your store, or if the parking lot's full, or if they don't, you know, if they have to walk too far and they don't want to do that, then that's something you've got to consider as a business owner that might be a barrier for that consumer to make a purchase at your store. There was a little book that I bought uh, years ago. Um, it's a marketing book. And one of the first things it starts off by saying is marketing is not something you do. Marketing is anything that helps or hinders the sale of a product. And so what that effectively means is that a parking lot being too full or not having enough parking at your business is a marketing problem because it hinders the sale of your product. Or if you do something that uh, you make the parking lot bigger, well, that's your marketing solution was to enlarge the parking lot because you help the sale of that product. So you have to look at, you know, uh, if from a marketing standpoint, that affects how people perceive your business. And so if you're known as the place that never has any place to park, it's good in terms of knowing that you have people at your store at all times. But think about all the people that can't get to your, your place of business. This kind of goes back into the, the last one, they, the one-stop shop idea. Um, and it's the same reason that now Dollar General has, I know I, I flipped a house in South Haven a few years ago and I needed painter's tape, but I didn't want to deal with Lowe's, and so I went to Dollar General and lo and behold, they had painter's tape. And I would have never guessed, you know, <laughs> Dollar General would have some of these like home improvement items, but they really are a one-stop shop. I could pick up a jug of milk, I could get a loaf of bread and I could get my painter's tape at the same building. 
And so that's the kind of mentality that the consumers here have in this sort of business that they want to patronize, is having a little bit of everything so that they don't have to go multiple places. So any questions on that? After this, we'll move into more of our you know, suggestions and strategies that we've seen be very effective. But just on the data and some of the findings that we have there, any questions y'all have on that before we move forward? On our leakage that we talked about, um, have you seen dramatic turnarounds in any of the towns you serve to hold those numbers down to a lower to do away with some of the leakage is what I'm saying. What's interesting, um, and we use this term a lot with uh, working with hotels, is um, when we do a feasibility study for a hotel, which a lot of times are done for the purposes of banks because they lend against it, we always project out a stabilized year. And so you might build that hotel this year in 2022, but it may not stabilize in terms of the market until 2025. And so what we found during COVID is that it helped local businesses a lot with the ones that were allowed to remain open when COVID happened because then they didn't go and leak into other markets. They stayed at home, they spent dollars at home, and so the cities were able to retain those dollars. What's happened now is that since a lot of the mandates have you know, expired and people are allowed to get out now, um, what's happened is they've all flocked out and now they're taking more dollars than they were before in spending them in, in outside markets. And so I'm waiting for the point at which things kind of stabilize, and that's where I'll use that term um, that we've used in sales before, is I think in the next you know, year or so, we'll see that stabilize and return back to a more normal rate. Because right now, the trend is that there is more money being spent outside of these city limits than, than would normally be. And I think that's just, you know, People were tired of being at home and, and tired of, you know, being stuck, you know, and so now they're all rushing out, people are traveling more, people are going out and shopping, taking vacations, and so that's where I think you'll see kind of a surge of that, but then that will dwindle um, as things go back to normal. And so I think that these numbers will be reliable, but at the end of the day, it's, we're living in times right now where, you know, so the like, sky's now, orange, and I believe. Now we're able to improve. Um, those numbers, at what point would we remeasure those numbers and, and know more about it? We typically try to do that once a year. Our mobile device data, our cell phone data, is updated in real time, and so we can see that, what happened here yesterday, as far as that's concerned. But it's not always beneficial to look at it through such a, a closed lens just because you may not be getting the bigger picture. And so what we try to look at is a more annual, at minimum, you know, sometimes quarterly trends, but usually annual trends to see, all right, this is what happened last year, what's happening this year. Um, just because you are talking about so many people doing so many different things. We um, drew a circle around the, those two areas that we have identified. Mm -hmm. About how far out would we, are we 20 miles away or? I'd say, you know, for the most part, you know, until you started getting close to Tupelo as far as the secondary retail trade area, how far is Fulton from here? About 20 miles? Roughly, yeah. I'd say that that's a pretty good average. Again, with our trade area, it's, it's not exactly like any distance because it's based on the consumers and where they live. And so it is a unique boundary. It's, it's not a radio or a drive time. But I would say if you want to sum up, you know, the majority of the people that would shop here frequently would be around the 20 mile mark. And having the interstate here makes that trade area more of a linear, linear pattern just because you have such a quick way to get here. And that is, you know, I-22 obviously. And so then if, you know, say for instance in Savannah, Savannah doesn't have any interstate there and then so you've got Eight, eight or nine different ways just to get, you know, somewhere there. And so then their trade area would be kind of, you know, more like a spider web versus here. It's very linear just because you have such a quick way to get from over here to over here via I-22. Um, and so that's the pattern that we noticed there. And it was only exacerbated by the building of the loves. And so having the loves here just created more, you know, movement, you know, as far as that east-west traffic is concerned. It's exciting too. A lot of more rural markets. That's what's good about it. 
is that people are not as densely concentrated. And so we see that your reach is much, much greater than just the city limits even of Hamilton because there are people that are living in spaces that are outside of the city that will still locate here. And so you're locating the retail in a more dense area so that people will come in and kind of have an experience. They'll shop here and they'll stop at the pharmacy and they'll stop at the next place. But they might be coming in from 20 miles. Whereas where we see in, in some cities that are larger or more dense, that might be a five mile radius. It just kind of depends on where you are. I know this this is census information, but do y'all look at like the mean age in a community like ours? We do, and that really, to break it down for what we use where, it really depends on the criteria of the retailer. And so um, right now I'm, I'm working on a couple of different things, one of which is a grocery store. And so then we're looking more on like, you know, um, average, average size of the family would be a more important one there just because we know that obviously even though they may not show up with a cell phone because they don't have, you know, a cell phone yet, they still have to be fed, and so they would be a, a grocery consumer, even though their parents or whatever may be buying the groceries. And so we'll look at things like that on a very specific basis. Um, usually age is, it, it's not always used. It would be more so if there was something destination-oriented, like we find that the average age of like a Bass Pro Shop is higher uh, than it would be uh, just because typically when people have a lot of time to hunt and fish they're usually retired and so the biggest consumer there is someone that obviously has the means and, and the time to to spend dollars at a place like that and it's not that younger people don't shop there but the majority of their consumers would be on the, the older end of the spectrum uh, incomes are very important to us that's something else we look at because that represents how much money you have available to spend and so we call that disposable income. So basically, after you pay your taxes, hopefully you do, um, we, you, have, you have money left that you can spend on things like groceries and even your, your home, home improvement, your car. And so that all represents potential income that can be converted into something, you know, uh, basically a sell at any of these local businesses. And so that's kind of how we... We sum it all up. There's not, I wouldn't say that there's one single um, aspect of like census data or any of our data points that we look at solely without looking at the bigger picture of what it all means together. And that is kind of half the battle is what does it all mean? And so that's where we find ourselves working with a lot of the retailers. We do a lot of financial forecasting as well. Uh, like right before I, I got here, I was on the phone with Zaxby's and we were working with the franchisee there on a financial forecast for him potentially doing a store in one of our communities. And so, you know, it's not an exact science, but we're taking a lot of that information that you're talking about, putting it together and saying, all right, well, we know these people like to eat at Zaxby's, how much do they spend on average, how much do, can they spend, how often they eat out, you know, and so when we put all that together, how much should this store make in its first year? And so for them, it's all right, if they pass the threshold, say it's $2 million, if we can show that they can make at least $2 million in their first year, they'll build it all day long. But we have to be able to verify and show that, hey, this is a $2 million store, not a $1.5 million store. And so that's some various ways that we use that sort of data. Location data is super important in that, too. It's really neat how we've been able to expand what used to be demographics, which is what we kind of based, what incomes and, you know, what that looks like and you know what the household income is and how many people are in the household but now it's kind of expanded into a term that they call psychographics and so that's where we're kind of combining what the demographic looks like based on where the people are as well and so a lot of times like Casey said if you have a retiree they may be spending more in sporting goods. My favorite example is if you have a group of millennials I guarantee that the part of their disposable income that Casey was talking about that's spent on restaurants is not proportionate to their total amount of disposable income because they're prioritizing spending their money in different spaces. They're spending rent money on restaurants. I mean, it really is true, though. And so we'll see even, you know, once people get to a certain age, you might have someone who lives in the outskirts of town on five acres, and they raise their family there, and then once they're empty nesters, a lot of times we see them move in to town and downsize their houses. Well, then they're spending more money in town and cooking at home less. I'm, I'm sure that your demographics are skewed as well in terms of people that frequent your business. Yeah. So it goes the same way with every type of retailer, so they're all kind of looking for something different, which I think is really neat. So 
one of the things that we've been trying to do as well as provide all this data, obviously, is really to help, if nothing more, show some of the things that we've seen in our, in our work that's been successful. Um, and I personally worked in 30 states and 400 cities, and so I've seen a little bit of everything. And so I've obviously think, seen things that are not successful. I've seen things that are very successful. And so what we've been trying to do is mix in some of these things that we see being successful uh, in our travels so that if there are local businesses that use this information, then that's helpful to them. So this and this pre part of this presentation was put together by our director of marketing, Carmen Cristo, uh, who I wish could be here today. Um, but she uh, has successfully helped a lot of boutiques open as well as doing marketing for us. And so she's got kind of a, a keen eye for uh, what makes a successful local business and what makes an unsuccessful local business. And so a lot of this is, is things that she's used uh, in, in her practice as well as things that we try to relay back to local businesses and cities where we work. But basically what this is saying here is that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And so that means that by sharing in something locally, it could potentially be worth so much more to you and to others in your community. Um, a lot of the things that go into something like what's up here right now is talking about cross-marketing and really like you're not losing something to a competitor if they're, if they're here in Hamilton. Your job at that point is you got them here. If they're, if they're sitting in downtown Hamilton and they want to make a purchase, half the battle has been won. So then you have to compete on other levels, but generating that traffic and getting them here you only stand to gain from that by working together. And that's something that we try to, to preach over and over as we go uh, from community to community is that, uh, as she put up here, more retail, more interest, more jobs, more people with money to spend, more opportunity for everyone. That just, that is a fact. And, and I promise you, uh, I wouldn't have it up here if it weren't true, but across the board, we've seen thriving downtowns um, that are thriving be that way because they do work together and they do things like cross marketing and, and you know at the end of the day if you own a shoe store and I walk in there and I'm looking to buy shoes and you don't have my size send me to another one because at least then I'll remember oh well, I always get shoes in Hamilton that's where I get shoes there's a place in Pontotoc actually called Progressive Shoe Store I don't know if y'all have ever heard of it but it was it was a huge deal, and sadly it closed, but uh, it was a huge deal. There was, a, I think, a couple of guys that had been on like national TV and um, made mention of it and said that you know, they had gotten their shoes from Pontotoc, Mississippi. Uh, but that was the type of place where, I promise you, if you couldn't get it progressive, they would send you somewhere that had it. It wouldn't matter if they lost the sale or not, because they wanted to be known that, hey, everyone that needs shoes starts right here. Because they know if they start right there and they don't have it, they'll get them somewhere that does have it. And that's the sort of mindset that we're talking about here is really having that community mindset where you're all working for the same purpose, even if you sell the same product. It's the same reason, going back to AutoZone, um, a question I get asked a lot um, at these workshops is, why does AutoZone and O'Reilly's go right across the street from one another? And the reason for that is that they don't want to divide that trade area in half. So if you've got O'Reilly's up here and AutoZone down here, say you've got north of the city and south of the city, you've effectively taken your trade area that I just showed you up there from Hamilton and divided in half. Because everybody that lives north of the city is going to O'Reilly's and everyone south of the city is going to AutoZone. But if you put them right across the street from one another, you can't compete on any basis of geography. You can't be any closer to your competitor or, or, or whatever if you're right across the street. So then what they have to do is they have to compete on the basis of like who has the best coupons, who's got the best prices, best customer service. But at least then they've eliminated one thing that they have to compete on. And that really is important even for local businesses. You know, if you want to run a shoe store, find the other shoe store in town, be right next door. At least then when someone shows up and you don't have what they need or vice versa, you got a consumer there. And you're not competing on any other basis that, other than what you have in your inventory or who's got the best prices or customer service or what have you. It's a lot up here, so I, you know, I'll, I'll summarize, but it's a, kind of an extension of what I was talking about. At the end of the day, the more business that comes here and locates 
be it local or national chains, creates more tax revenue for the city to put back into things like economic and community development. And so that's where, you know, at the end of the day, I go back to the original phrase I used, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. There's no business that's locating here that would potentially not help you in some way. Um, and I know that there's always a lot of talk of competition, but at the same time, like, you know, we're, we've dealt with some really big box stores coming into com communities, and um, I've seen it be successful and unsuccessful for some of the local businesses there. I've seen some of the local businesses do better because some people just don't like to shop at those types of stores. And then I've seen some, obviously, that could not compete. Um, but what I will say is that by having that additional tax revenue, no matter what it is, a business is coming in here, gets put right back into the community. And so then it could be either police or fire, or, you know, helping out the chamber or whatever, you know, the, the ambitions of the, the community are. But it does help the existing businesses. And that's something that we like to make sure is, is worked into our presentation because I'm going to be out there recruiting new businesses to town, but at the same time, the last thing I want to see is any of the local businesses suffer from that. And so we want to make sure that we first uplift the local businesses, and then I'll go out there and do the recruiting that I'm talking about. So being a team player, um, and some of the examples she's got on here, it's not just cross-marketing of, of products, but also, you know, events, hosting events together. And she's got some examples in here that are pretty cool. Um, but, you know, being creative with how you market your business and, and not just, you know, this is my business, I don't need anyone else's help and, and independent, but really trying to figure out, you know, if, if you're a coffee shop, how do I work with the local flower shop, you know, or, or how do I, you know, and I'm just giving, you know, random examples, but at the same time, how do you build into your marketing and into your existing business a way to cross market set up events and reach other consumers ultimately through the other businesses that are here. That could be as simple as, you know, having, leaving a stack of business cards. I got a stack of business cards, mine right here for y'all, but leaving a stack of business cards at another local business saying, hey, you know, if someone ever comes in and needs this, give them my card. You know, I've seen insurance agents do it. It's not just retail, it's just any way possible to work with other businesses so that if someone does show up in a flower shop one day and their car just got hit or something like that, there's, there's someone that, you know, they might want to send their way. Oh, I know a good insurance company, you might want to switch adjusters or whatever. That's something that I think would be really cool to see, especially in communities of this size, is the businesses coming together uh, to make that sort of thing happen. Being a sounding board, I think that's really important. I can attest to like having started a business, there's, and I wouldn't say I've even got it figured out at this point, but there's a, a, a really big hurdle of trying to figure out what to do and what not to do when you don't know anything. And that was me starting out and it took a lot of uh, you know, running into brick walls to figure out what to do, but there's a lot of value that local businesses can have <coughs> in terms of being that sounding board and telling you from their experience what has worked for them or not worked for them or how to do this or how to do that. And so that should be encouraged and I think that's something that's really important to create this shop local mentality and, and, and help other local businesses thrive. The last one just, you know, encourage people to shop locally. Do you have to go to Tupelo to get it or is there somewhere in town that you could send someone, you know, say, hey, you know, I know they got it in downtown or they've got, you know, this, um, and loves. I mean, I'm not even saying it has to be local, just the mindset of keeping them shopping in Hamilton is what we're trying to cultivate. Evolve with the times. That's something that we've we've seen a lot of local businesses struggle with. Um, and that's, you know, we've seen it not just, you know, in one state or one part of the U.S., it's across the board, but a lot of businesses that are locally owned sometimes have this almost like hobby mentality where, you know, this is, we do this for fun, we really don't need the money, we just, you know, and those are the ones most often that are not doing some of the things that are down here. And we've seen it, you know, there's been an uptick, especially after COVID, where people have realized, hey, 
either go out of business or figure, away, figure out a way to incorporate social media, online, email marketing, those types of things, just because when everyone's closed down, you only have one way to sell a product, and that is online. And so that's where, you know, that's kind of changed even since the pandemic. But um, I, we even put in here, I'm not knocking newspapers by any means, because there's definitely a lot of value to running ads in newspapers and coupons. But maybe mix in some social media, mix in a little bit of, you know, at least have a website. We've seen a lot of local businesses where, uh, especially true with restaurants, First thing I do, because I travel a lot, I'll look up local restaurants, but if I can't see a menu, it's it's hard pressed for me to, to take a chance on a place when I don't know what food you serve, you know? And so that's where I want to be able to see a menu, some pictures of the food, and so check out what your online presence is if you own a restaurant or even a, a local boutique. Find out what people are seeing that have never been to your place of business and, and try to take charge and, and make sure that that is a, uh, a good advertisement and, and not a, a, either a poor one or a non-existent one. Create an experience. This is something especially for people my age and Laney's age is that we all want an experience now. It's not just enough to go have a cup of coffee. You've got to have couches and you've got to have music playing and you've got to have other things besides coffee that you sell. Which, you know, sometimes I roll my eyes at that, but at the same time, it's because our generation has demanded that we need more than just a cup of coffee. We're not, we're, it's not good enough for us to go to a truck stop and grab a, a cup of coffee, a coffee at Love's. We have to go in a coffee shop and take a seat and sit with our laptop and have some, you know, type up an email or um, do some homework or something like that. That's just what our generation does. And so that's what this is talking about here is really having some things that would appeal to people that or consumers that want this type of experience. And it's not, you know, I, I believe me, I don't think that Starbucks does everything right, but there's a reason they're the largest, you know, coffee shop in the U.S. And so that's where you have to wonder sometimes, like, you know, maybe they do know something that we don't, and that is that creating an inviting environment, you know. It's always, you know, nice chairs. It's always full in every Starbucks that I've ever been in. Um, tailor your store experience to your particular audience. I've seen them in an interview process, you know, uh, in various coffee shops, not just Starbucks, and even locally on ones, uh, just because I, I do, when I'm traveling, I go in a lot of coffee shops and I'll sell my laptop and work. But they try to hire people that fit with the type of people that they sell their product to. It has nothing to do with uh, how well they know how to run the, the espresso machine, but more so how they connect with the customers. And that really is important, especially for locally owned businesses, is that if you've got, you know, a hipster crowd coming to your place of business, have a hipster behind the, you know, behind the, the front desk, behind the, the cash register. And so that's just kind of what this is talking about there, is really know who your consumer is and cater to that. Capitalize on the connection that you have with your consumers. Um, and the last one I think is my favorite out of this, and I'll let y'all read it, but really making things easy, and it seems like such a simple concept, but the easier you make it for a consumer to make a purchase, the more likely it is for them to make that purchase. And that's it's not rocket science, it's not anything like I've come up with, it just is the simple truth. And I think that really boils down to it's sometimes good to step away from your local business and say, how easy is it for someone to walk in here and get what they need? And that can be any number of things. It can be a clothing store, it can be a restaurant. You know, do they have to wait an hour to, to be seated? Is there a better way that we can, you know, maybe when it's nice outside, seat them on a patio? Is there a way that we can accommodate where these people are getting the easiest experience? They're making the easiest purchase of their life. You'll notice with car dealerships, Everything at a car dealership, they try to make easy. They're putting papers in front of you, giving you a pen. You need any coffee while you wait, Mr. Page? You, you know, and so they're, everything there is meant to be easy because you're making a big purchase. And so they know that the, the least hesitation that they can get involved with that purchase, the more likely it is to happen. And so uh, this can go in any direction, but making things easy is, is such a huge thing um, for local businesses. 
and again, I talked a little bit about social media. Um, it's not just enough now to have it, and, and personally, I don't have social media. I, I, it's not something I even do, which is ironic that I have to talk about it, but um, we have it for the company, obviously, so I understand enough about it for that, but it's no longer enough to just have it and post it. You have to now engage your audience and get them to do what you're wanting them to do. And that's not a one-time thing. And so just having a social media presence is definitely good, but nowadays you have to really stand out amongst the crowd and engage that group. And there will be some examples that I'll show you guys that are really cool of ways in, in which that uh, some of the businesses that we've looked at have engaged their, their crowd. But it, having that you know, audience engagement, it's not just social media. Um, it's you know having events and, and doing things like I was talking about earlier, cross marketing, that helps to engage these people and these consumers of yours. So these are some examples uh, that Carmen put together for us. Uh, this is actually in Tupelo. It's a meadery, and uh, you know my understanding. I haven't been there, but my understanding is that it's very similar to beer, but it's like uh, a medieval version of beer. I think it's made from honey. But anyway, kind of out there for North Mississippi, but you know, it seems to do really well in Tupelo. And I, I suspect some of the reasons for that are some of the examples that I'm going to give you of what they're doing with their social media. So they have quite a following already. Um, obviously, it's a niche business, so I'm sure not everyone in Tupelo is going to the meadery. But in a town like Tupelo, where you've got a trade area of 500,000 people, you get 100,000 of those, or even 50,000 of those, going to the meadery on a regular basis. They're, going, they're making quite a bit of money. So this, what this is talking about here, and I know you, it's probably you can't read it, uh, but I'll kind of read it to you. This is where they partnered with Tupelo to go. So basically having some of their local food trucks and lo local restaurants partner together with the meadery where they can offer food at the meadery. So the meadery doesn't specialize in food. Uh, to my knowledge, they don't have food there. But there's food trucks in Tupelo. There's other restaurants that can deliver food over to, to the meadery that are locally owned. And so what they've been trying to do is not only sell their product, but help other businesses to sell theirs as well. And so obviously, if you're going in and drinking, I would hope at some point you might want to get a little bite to eat uh, and hopefully not drive home. But with this, you have the option of getting food while you're there. And even though the meadery doesn't actually produce the food, they're working with other locally owned businesses that are selling this food. And so this is just a good example of not an event, but really cross-marketing and, and having something um, where you're helping someone else out, which also helps you sell your product. Here's a couple of events they've got set up here for a brunch box for lunch. And so basically they've got an agreement with one of the restaurants in town that they will deliver these brunch boxes. And so then when people come into the meadery, they can come in for brunch. Well, they don't have, the meadery doesn't have to cook the food, but they're going to have food there courtesy of XYZ restaurant in town. So these are just good examples of how you can work together and really like cross market for each other. This is another good example of a, a coffee house, coffee shop in Tupelo where Part of their engagement, obviously, is with their food and their product, but also, look what they got over here. This is their uh, preseason top 10, 2018. This is uh, basically the picks, I guess, for, uh, for football or basketball or something like that. So then, they're not just selling you coffee, they're talking about local sports. You know, and that was the first thing that y'all talked about this morning when y'all got in here was the basketball game last night. So as a local business owner, get on, get on your, uh, your Facebook or your Instagram or now Snapchat, TikTok. Uh, I don't know, are there any others that I'm leaving out? I'm kind of square in that regard. But, uh, you know, get on there and talk about the basketball game or, or have, like, you know, maybe a highlight reel. You know, that's the big thing now is, like, you know, everything's a video. And so on your reels or your, uh, your Snapchat, have a... A snap if on your your business Instagram or your your business Snapchat have a uh, a highlight reel from the the basketball game if you were there, and so you know things like that have nothing to do with coffee, so nothing on here other than the pictures you know that you see there have nothing to do with coffee, but they're engaging the local crowd and they're talking about local sports, and so that's where you know 
Um, I can't tell you how to, to do it for your business, but at the same time, I can tell you that this works. is very successful, and they see you know a conversion rate from that. Oops. New battery in my. Here we go. So this is always the big one that we, we talk about, and this is another simple truth. <laughs> I'm full of them today, but you have to be open to make money. That's just how it works, and and that really is you know the this summation of that. I see so many businesses where. Um, they're wondering why their sales are down, and they look at their store hours, and they're just, who's buying your product? Either someone that has way too much money, or someone that has no money at all. Um, and you hope it's the, the former, not the latter, but a lot of businesses are selling to the unemployed, just because they are not open when people that have a job would like to purchase their products. And so we, we try not to harp on it too much, but at the same time, it is so important that store hours be considered. Um, if, if you open at 10 a.m. and close at 4, uh, you know, I have a, an a 8 to 5 job. I can't shop at your store, or I'm going to have to decide, do I want lunch today, or do I want to go to your store and, and get what I need? Um, this is an actual like, picture I took. It's hard to see. Luckily, they are open on Saturday. But this is a boutique in a town that we were in. Uh, I won't say where. Uh, it's closer to Laney's house than mine. But, but uh, their hours are Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5. And so you know, besides Saturday, they're open only three days a week. And two of the three days that they're open, they're only open when I'm at work. And so, you know, come on. I mean... I'm not saying that you have, the thing that people don't realize is you don't have to work more hours. Just adjust your hours. Get there at 3 o'clock and then close at 7. Work less hours, but at least then you stand the chance to get someone that's at work till 5 o'clock to stop by and get what they need before they go home. So important. Overall, think outside the box. I can promise you these are not all the ideas that are out there, there's plenty more that we don't have time for, but at the same time, there's things that, you know, they're very creative that have worked. Um, that's where I talk about, you know, like the, the meadery having a restaurant cater in some lunch so that they have food there as well. Um, or even just having a, a highlight reel from the basketball game on your, your company's Facebook page or the Instagram. Engage your audience. Think of things that people probably haven't thought of yet so that, you know, you are engaging that crowd that you're trying to sell to. Um, I can assure you, like, you know, just today, you'll walk out of here and at least think of something, hey, maybe I could incorporate that in my business. And that's where we can't tell everybody individually how to run their business, but at the same time, by giving you some examples of things that people have done, um, we've seen a lot of people take that and just kind of run with it. And it's much better ideas than we've even presented but it's just ways that they've never thought of before, how to capture that audience and engage them and ultimately work with other businesses to help each other, because we're all here to do the same thing, and that is to drive business to Hamilton. And so I think that by working together, that uh, should be the ultimate goal, and I think there's, there's ways in which to do that. Any questions about any of that? How important, uh, if you're going to be a merchant, let's say, in Hamilton, Alabama, how important is it to get some professional help uh, for these ideas and concepts uh, before you open those doors so that you go in with a feel for what the customers need, what the customer will react to, uh, how to get them back in your store if you ever get them in there. Mm -hmm. uh, is, are those type of training, we've got several fairly new boutiques and shops in town. I want every one of them to be successful and grow their business. Uh, Cole comes from a business that's three generations owned and, and he's picked up the reins and, and doing a fantastic job carrying the family tradition on. And, He's got a broad customer base built in. But these new shops that have come in, a lot of them maybe 
walked out of business, but have they actually put their time in and training to run that business? And how important is that? It's that? very important, and that's what I was going to say. You know, we've done one-on-one -on -one trainings with businesses before, and and the sort of work that we do. Um, again, I'm I'm a data guy, and so I'm always looking at numbers and and trying to figure out who is the consumer, how much are they spending, that sort of thing. And I'm not saying that you could only do that with data, but I think it ultimately is important to know who's shopping at your, your place of business or who you want to be shopping at your place of business. And I think there's ways in which to figure that out, number one, and then once you do have that figured out, to, to further that and have that customer be more engaged and potentially a repeat customer. And so we work with businesses one-on-one -on -one before. There was a, we did a seminar once in Andalusia, Alabama. Um, to be true, right off 84, and so um, there was a, a clothing store. I, I remember this has been years ago, but Carmen and I were down there, and we ended up working one on one with this clothing store. And Carmen was showing her something, obviously, I don't know what she was doing, but she was showing her some type of app that she could implement with her Instagram where it would allow her to sell merchandise through Instagram. I don't even know what it was called. Uh, but we were there, we spent about an hour with her, maybe an hour and a half that day. And then the next day, Carmen got a phone call saying, I've already gotten a sell through this. And I'm sure it's, you know, probably a shirt or something like that, 15, 20 bucks. But literally having us there, Carmen sitting down with her and saying, all right, you know, here's something that you could try. She did it that afternoon. By the next day, she had already gotten a sell from it. And so that's an instant return on investment from having us been, you know, sitting down with her and, and working with her and, and talking about these sorts of things. But... I think it's incredibly important um, to to know that hey, you know, everything's constantly evolving. You're not, you know, to say that you know, well, we're going to do what we've done for 30 years for the next 30. You know, you'd be hard pressed if you can do it. And let me know the strategy. But right now, things are changing so quickly, especially with all that's happening in the world. You just can't sit still, and that's where you know any information um, I, I don't think should be discounted. And that's where. We're happy to work with businesses one on one. We've done a lot of it, but I, I think it's important to to have some of these ideas and toss around some of these ideas. And it's not we don't have it all figured out by any means, but we've just seen some things be very successful, and that's really what we bring to the table is being able to show, hey, this worked really well for this type of business, and just kind of having their rolodex of what we've seen out in our course of work and, and travels, uh, and and hopefully being able to help someone in Hamilton do the exact same thing. Because the beauty of the, the retail mix, though, is having some national retailers who are likely the people that Casey's talking to and having your local tenants. Because from my perspective and from what we've seen in cities across America, trust is the beginning and the end of the retailer-consumer relationship. And so whether it's generations of family legacy and someone showing up because they trust your brand and they trust your family, or because I know if I go to Starbucks that I'm going to order the exact same coffee every time I go and it's going to be consistent and I'm getting the same thing and it's going to be a quality product that's going to be in my hand in five minutes. And so there's, there's beauty to both sides of it, right? So I would argue that most of your local businesses are probably run by locals. And so I think if you probably had somebody come in from 50 miles away and try to open a local business, it's maybe not going to do as well. And so what you get from the national retailers is the credibility. We know they're going to pay their bills. We know if, if this store isn't successful, then there's another one a couple towns over that is, which means they can still keep the lights on and weather a hard time, whereas maybe our local businesses have a harder time there. Your local businesses have the advantage of the community involvement and of the people. And so I'd argue in some instances you could put you know, a, a Nordstrom next door to a boutique and people wouldn't shop there because they're loyal to your local business. So that's what's cool about having a mix and what will be neat about the fact, especially in growing communities, to me, people will come in and they'll look for a checklist of, do you have this retailer, do you have this retailer, and they're not necessarily maybe willing to locate to a new city unless you have some reputable national retailers. But on the same line, you don't want to sacrifice the, the character and the personality of your community, which is why it's so important that we keep the local retailers professional and able to service the community in a way that, that grows with the community as it expands. I know when uh, I was still in high school at the time, but in Pontotoc, when they built the Supercenter there, 
I remember, because we knew the owner of the Piggly Wiggly there, and they were very, you know, nervous, upset, you know, afraid it's going to hurt their business. But then for the next, you know, this has been probably 15 years ago, but for the next <coughs> 15 years, I watched my mom twice a week go to Piggly Wiggly and get all of her meat. And so she still goes to Walmart, she'll get her dry goods there, but she still goes Piggly Wiggly once or twice a week and gets steaks and, you know, chicken and all that because she doesn't like the meat at Walmart. And so that's where, you know, I, yeah, you're going to get some people buying those goods there, but if you've got a loyal customer base, that's not changing. I mean, I, I'm telling you, like, I've, I've seen it. I've seen, obviously, some that have faltered, but I think that that's not a result of the business that came into town. I think it's that their customer base wasn't that loyal. But if you got, there's a, even an Ecru, there's a locally owned uh, grocery store. Uh, it's, I, I think it's even better than Piggly Wiggly, but uh, he's been open for, for as long as I've been alive, and I know that there are people that drive from 30, 45 minutes to go get me just because he'll, they'll hand cut it. I mean, whatever cuts you want, they'll take a whole loin and you just tell them what thickness you want and they'll do it all, um, wrap it up for you, you know, with a smile. And that's just, that keeps people loyal right there. You don't have to worry about Walmart when you've got that level of customer service and, and he's got that customer base there. And so I think, you know, if you're doing everything that you're supposed to and doing it right, I don't think any business would ever be a harm to a local business just because, you know, people like where they shop, you know, and if they don't like where they shop, then they will go somewhere else. But that doesn't mean, you know, it's nothing against Walmart or any of the others. If you had o opened a locally owned grocery store that, you know, was to compete with your grocery store and you had better meat or better prices, then you're still competing against them, you know, that's just how it works. I've been in business here since 85, retailer. Um, and, and Cole will attest to this, but you know, you, you can go shop in Walmart, you take your time and you shop and you know, you're, you're enjoying the experience, but when you get to the cash register is when you lose it, you know, <laughs> because they don't sell service, no. you know, at all. No. And you're paying, they, you're paying they predicted, to check out your own sale. They predicted our <laughs> demise brick and mortar stores 20 years ago. You know, Amazon was going to put us all out of business, but we're finding that people are really kind of. They're, they're about the experience now that you spoke of, and they're, they're about building relationships, you know, and they're about not having to box the daggum thing up and send it back, you know, because it didn't fit right. And, and they're going to survive. I mean, we're not making a dent in Amazon, but we're, you know, retailers are, like us, are having to find a niche and, and keep our customers. You know, we're customer-oriented. I mean, they're my customer. And when they're not, they're somebody else's, and they're hard to get back. Right. You know, so you do whatever it takes to build these relationships, and that's where the big box stores. I walked through the Barnes Crossing Mall the other day, first time I've been in there in two years. What a disaster! I know. And what man, a I did yesterday. You know, nobody to wait on anybody. You know, clothes on the floor. You know, it was just it was. Terrible. It's pretty bad. I, I, I've not been in there in years, probably since I, I moved off for college and then after I, you know, came back I was mostly in Memphis and so, uh, but I walked through there for the first time in a long time yesterday and it just, it didn't even look like the same place. I mean, it's just that, it's like what you're saying, that level of customer service is just going with a lot of these places and it's even worse right now just because hiring people is so difficult, but, um, it, it is a mess, and that's where I think you're going to see a, a resurgence of locally owned businesses in, in downtown areas because people don't want to deal with that. They don't want to deal with Amazon. They don't want to go to an empty mall that's dying. They they want to go to places that are you know thriving, that have an experience, a positive experience. I think is probably the better way to say it because you definitely get an experience at Walmart. It's just <laughs> it's just not the one that you want. <laughs> well. Um you know, now I'm just a pharmacist and a little league coach, um, but but something that I see would be beneficial to our community is, um, you know, this is probably one on one, one on one for y'all. You know, some sort of SWOT analysis to our community, what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, you know, anytime I introduce something new at our store, we we do the four walls approach. So you know, we market. You know, we we're pretty high volume, very blessed. 
So we're going to try to attack all those people that are already using us with this product, mm -hmm. and then we'll grow it outside. So, you know, in our community, build those four walls around it, see what, see what our, you know, what we have, what we need, what we can do with them, and that grows itself. Now, I'm not saying we don't need to bring other folks in, mm -hmm. but that's just a key part. Um, and, you know, businesses that, that complement things or, or bring people, um, you know, loves is a great thing, um, but that's not going to get anybody to the jewelry store. Right. Um, you know, and so that kind of thought process is we're looking and, and searching and, and, and um, you know, but, but, you know, and also to touch on competition, it doesn't do anything to make us better. Absolutely. You know. I mean, you got two choices, either get better <laughs> or, or leave. I mean, that's really like what it boils down to. It's funny, pharmacy, her husband's a pharmacist, and I feel like we've hired pharmacists, and we've also, Walker, our vice president, was, uh, he sold pharmaceuticals for a while, so we've had a lot of dealings, and I've heard a lot of stories about pharmacies. One thing I've always been curious about there is, um, you know, the, I think the, the biggest you wouldn't, most people would see it as an asset, but the biggest asset that I see is that when people have to wait, you have captured a consumer and kept them there for a period of time. So as a business person myself, what I'm thinking is like, how do I sell them more while they're waiting? And so that's where I've seen pharmacies do this before where they have, you know, some really nice gift shops, and that could be even ran by someone else, but just having something attached where they're they're selling gifts or candles or something like that, something for people to do while they're waiting. And because the way I see it, I know people hate to wait at the pharmacy, but at the same time, that's an engaged consumer right there. They don't have anything else to do besides spend money, and so then give them more things to spend money on. And that's where I've always wondered, you know, what sort of things could you put, you know, with a pharmacy, you know, to, to get them to do. I know. One of the things that we uh, we worked on in the past is uh, with Dunkin' Donuts. They uh, they don't want to really uh, compete with any other places that serve something that you can eat, typically because people are running in there, they're grabbing a donut, a cup of coffee, or whatever. So what we found is that, and this is not always like the perfect match, but put them with uh, hair salons, just because you know there's usually a husband, or you know if you're going in there and you're waiting for your haircut. <coughs> go grab a donut and a cup of coffee while you wait. And that's worked out. It's been a really good tenant mix that we've seen before. I've worked with several different uh, hair cutting places, some of which were chains, and they love going next to coffee shops and vice versa just because, you know, they don't, say, they don't compete against each other and they help to sell each other's products just because at the end of the day, you might be waiting on a haircut, but Dunkin' Donuts is sitting right there. Go grab a donut and a cup of coffee while you're, you're waiting for your chair to be open. And so that's been, you know, something we've seen be very successful. So I, I all the time, like, think about things like that where, you know, how do you take what you currently do and what you primarily do and extend that in some form or fashion where um, you're either working with another local business or you're expanding your own business and, and creating another environment for people to spend money. I mean, that's what we're all trying to do is get them to spend money, um, obviously, you know, that's the reason, and I know I don't know how much time y'all have spent in, te in Texas, but they have Bucky's. I think Alabama's got Bucky's now too. We got two. We're about to have three. Three? Yeah. Man, I feel like big time it. living in Alabama. I'm about to say those things are huge. But when I first moved to Texas, I found out about Bucky's, and there's nothing they don't sell. And so you know, when you stop off the side of the interstate, whatever you need, I promise you, whatever you need. They probably have because they got seventy thousand square feet and a lot of stuff in it, and so you may have to look for it. You know, find someone to, to help you find it, but uh, chances are they have it. And so that's been like a big trend in Texas. Is just you stop at these gas stations. There are people that stop at some of these gas stations and spend an hour and a half, and I don't know where they're headed to, but I know how much time they spend at the gas station. And usually we're not far behind them. Yeah, I was about to say we're not normally far behind them, but you know. But I think you really hit it on the head. The, the collaborating with each other business wise, yeah, and teaming up and things like that. That's a um, well, that's a great idea that I hope uh, a lot of people hear. And well, density helps that some. So if you're right next to something else and someone's waiting their prescription and they can go next door and get a cup of coffee or whatnot, like that helps. To one have, stop shop. It I hate the word, but it, I mean it is real. And yeah. so if you have a, a dense downtown, your downtown is so cute. 
and it's got so many things and there's not a ton of just vacant space and that's very, 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 very healthy. Because anytime it's convenient, like you said, to go somewhere else, people are spending more money. So it's more about opportunity really than it is even disposable income sometimes. It's We're doing a lot of that downtown now. It looks just great. All the businesses are sharing each other's Facebook and Instagram posts, you know. And even if they share the same type of merchandise, you know, everybody's kind of drop the gauntlet and they're supporting each other. One of the things I've been thinking about, uh, and I was pretty excited about it a few years back, uh, we had a couple of folks uh, try to open a marine sales mm -hmm. in Hamilton. I, I was into fishing and boating some, and uh, mostly bass boats, but anyway, uh, but those businesses didn't succeed. We don't have a lake. We don't have any impoundments that you can actually run a motorboat mm -hmm. in nearby. You got to drive 30 minutes, 40 minutes to a lake. So, but here comes the ATV shop, and they're very successful because a lot of people trail ride, hunt, and use the type of vehicles they sell, and they, they've been very successful with the marine. So I'm wondering if a town like Hamilton needs to think a little bit about what we're compatible with, what the people want, uh, want to buy. I know there's necessities like groceries and food and gasoline and things, but uh, other uh, things that we might buy for pleasure or, or our needs. And uh, I wonder how important that is to be compatible with Oh, it's 100% important, and what comes to mind, there was a, a guy I know, and he's from that crew, he worked the line at Ashley Furniture for years, probably 15, 20 years, he was just an upholster guy, but uh, he went out on a limb and opened a <coughs> place at Ecru where they do uh, camo seat covers for your, your truck or even your ATV or your side-by-side. -side. That dude has made a fortune. and. Again, that just goes back to knowing your consumer. Here he was making, you know, ten dollars an hour at Ashley, and now he's a millionaire because he had the mindset of knowing, like, hey, there's something that these people would love that we are compatible with, you know, that, that would be compatible with them, and not being sold anywhere. And so he started that business, and it just took off. I've never seen it take off faster. And so, and I. Never purchased any for myself, but for for the people I know that that would go there, they go there, you know, at least once a year. They get a there would be a new mossy oak pattern come out. They go get that one, and so he he made a fortune off of that. But it really goes back to he saw that there was a need, and that what he was going to be selling was compatible with people that were there to purchase something. And that's why these workshops are so important. I always tell our clients. Casey's going to look at the data and he's going to say this is what on, on paper with numbers that your market can support. But say Casey says, you know, you need a juice bar that sells green celery juice. It's very healthy and they're doing great in Alabama. Well, I'll rather die than drink that stuff. <laughs> and so if we come in and you're like, I'm just going to drink juice bar, then we're not going to try to recruit a juice bar. And so that's why we love to be here and in the community because we want to bounce ideas off of you. We want to know based on your context in the community like what do you think that the people here would want and what do they support we've had a client before tell us we said we know that you could support a Walmart and they said we don't want it we, we love our local grocery store we don't want to threaten them they've been very good to our community he does really well in sales tax revenue and we're not willing to sacrifice his business for Walmart down the road we have determined you know what's your population increases to a certain extent then we'll look at putting Walmart in a different part of the town. But we need to know those kinds of things. So it's definitely important. Anything else? Hello, hello, Doctor. Just, Just getting started. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I put some of my cards up here. Y'all are feel free to take them. Um, contact us anytime. You know, that's what we're here for. Uh, like I said, we we do, uh, we have done some one-on-one -on -one type, you know, consultant work with local businesses, um, something we're always, you know, interested in doing, and uh, hopefully a lot of this information, you know, was, was new to you and, and helpful. It will be, 
wherever this video is posted will be included in that. I'll send him the, the PowerPoint so that that's mixed in. Do, do we have permission to show this to our merchants oh, yeah. uh, again? <coughs> The ones that couldn't be with us today. Absolutely. Okay. I think the more people it reaches, uh, the better. You know, I, I think that this is something that I think that some of the things pointed out, like we were talking about the, the cross marketing and working together. I think that that's something we need to get out there. As I say, it was a first for us for you guys to come to town and, and do this. And, we're kind of doing this program in segments. Uh, our next session will be with the uh, real real estate owners and developers of our area, and we've invited several to come in for that uh, session at one o'clock, I believe, and then you'll yeah. be uh, doing the finale with our council at three o'clock. Well, that's fireworks for y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We hope to get a uh, more. Uh, detailed uh, analysis of what you think of our city after being with us for a while and what might be a good fit or might be something we could recruit. Uh, I want to strengthen every business in town, first of all, and support them, but anything else that might come and fit with us uh, to uh, bring some more of that money that drifts away Absolutely. to our community. The, the city pays its bills through tax revenue. We offer services through tax revenue. That's why it's so important that we uh, get and retain retail business because at 9% sales tax, that means a lot to the city and the county and, and the people who depend on a tax base to pay their bills, so to speak. So what you guys are doing for us and what the other folks who are brave enough to put in these retail shops are doing for us must be appreciated from the city's side uh, because that's really what uh, makes things good. I, I, I used to sit on a board with a guy and his motto, and he was a businessman, he said, uh, early to bed, early to rise, work like the devil and advertise. That was kind of his <laughs> motto as he went through life. and. Uh, uh, he didn't change that much, and he was pretty successful. And, um, but he didn't know Nava Retail either. So uh, that on our website. we're, we're yeah. depending on you guys to help us a lot. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, where do you work? So I'm the manager of the Millhouse College.